So do you think the FAA is sitting at home right now? The inspectors are sitting at home during COVID, watching YouTube, looking for people violating UAV rules? Well, we're gonna talk about that in just a second. I actually have a couple things on my mind today. First of all, regarding remote ID, and then we're gonna talk about that. We're gonna talk about inspectors and what they're doing and if they're doing anything during COVID. And then finally, I have something that I've been wanting to show you for a very long time, for like almost three years. I've been sitting on this and I think it's time I finally showed you. Hey, welcome back everyone. Thank you for watching the video today. If you happen to be new here, my name is Russ. Go ahead and watch a few more videos after you're done watching this one on the channel. And if you find value here, click on that subscribe button and follow me on social media. Okay, first thing, remote ID. It's a hot topic. It's always gonna be a hot topic, but you know, it's been a very long time coming, but it appears to be nearly upon us. For the remainder of October, there are several meetings planned, like right now, as I'm making this video, there's a meeting going on, but there's several meetings planned for the rest of this month where the final ruling for remote ID will be fully structured, it will be complete. Now, what is discussed during these meetings? I have no idea, but the people that have called these meetings are pretty much 100% involved in commercial ventures. Okay, as I was editing this video, drinking my Starbucks this morning, going through these names and looking at some of them, one of them really stood out to me and it's Brendan Groves. Now, Mr. Groves currently works for Skydio. He is their head of regulatory and policy affairs. But prior to that, he's a highly decorated Air Force vet and then also the Associate Deputy Attorney General for the Department of Justice. Now, what did he do there? He managed the Department of Justice National Security Policy Portfolio and he led their drone program. He also developed our country's counter UAS policies. The guy is a freaking unicorn and the team at Skydio drafted him last February because Adam Bry is a damn genius. You see, there are two ways to dethrone a $3 billion per year company. You can either create a better product or you can make it very difficult for them to distribute their product. I think Skydio is using the latter. Yes, they have a good product with the Skydio and their commercial version of the Skydio, and the autonomy is truly impressive. But as a whole, if you look at the big picture, DJI is winning when it comes to quality, manufacturing, and distribution. Now, I think in time, Skydio is gonna catch up, uh, but for now, they are winning this battle because they're drafting a team of juggernauts that are connected, well-connected to our governmental infrastructure. Like, look at who they recently added to their team. A 20-year Navy SEAL with 11 combat deployments, an Army platoon leader during Operation Iraqi Freedom, and a 27-year law enforcement veteran with a long history of developing beyond visual line-of-sight operations. Skydio is comprised of real American heroes, people who have dedicated their lives to make sure that America wins. And whether you agree with this strategy or not, you have to admit that it's truly remarkable. Now, the biggest win yet for Skydio is being selected as one of the trusted drone providers for our federal government's blue project. Okay, let's see. Brendan Groves, former Department of Justice National Security Policy Manager, now Skydio employee, Skydio wins blue contract. This is how the world works, you guys. It's all about who's on your team. All right, back to the video. So thank you to Geeks Vana for bringing these meetings to our attention. At least that's the first person that I was made aware of that brought this to our attention. So thank you, Sean, very much for uh, for telling us about these things going on. So I'll link his um, channel down in the video description if you wanna check his stuff out. He has a pretty good channel. But once again, the recreational drone pilot has been left out of the conversation. Even with over 50,000 comments submitted last spring, there is still no consideration whatsoever to the people that own and operate the majority of drones in this country. Remote ID is at the doorstep and they will be busting down the door in the coming weeks. Now, how do we prepare for this? Well, in my opinion, you really can't. We're just gonna have to keep flying, keep doing what you're doing, because even after the ruling has been made, it will take several months to implement everything. This is a major undertaking, and a lot more meetings need to happen before everything is active and in place. And then depending on the final rulemaking, 
I'm actually pretty interested to see how many lawsuits are gonna follow. I'm thinking there's a lot of lawyers that are gonna make a lot of money over the next two or three years, but we'll have to see. So once it is active, once everything's all said and done and everything's in place, then what? Do millions of drone owners find a different hobby? Well, I think no, I don't think so. And this is why, and I'm gonna keep preaching about this at least until the FAA moves the bar again, but the technology advancements over the next two years in recreational drones, I think will continue to improve exponentially, driven not only by regulation, but also innovation. I believe that research and development will actually outpace regulation and small UAVs will dominate the recreational market. Look at how popular the Mavic Mini is already and it's not even that great. Imagine what a sub 250 gram drone will be like, what it'll be able to do two years from now. And the reason I say that is because so far, it appears that drones that weigh less than 250 grams would be immune from the coming remote ID verbiage. But I stress this, this is the government and they can change things whenever they want. But it's pretty reasonable to assume that UAVs the size of the Mavic Mini and smaller pose no threat to the commercial drone industry. Companies like DJI and others will flood the market with these smaller drones for hobbyists. And I truly believe that that is what will save the hobby of recreational drone flying. It's 100% my thoughts and my opinion, and if things change and if I'm totally wrong, I will be the first to admit it. But to me, it just makes sense. I don't know, let me know what you think down in the comments. Now, the second thing that I wanna to talk to you about today is in regards to a video that I watched a few days ago. Now, I'm not gonna refer to it specifically or link to it or anything like that, but I do want to say that I question the validity of the presenter's story. I could be way off. It's probably maybe totally true, but I really don't think it is, or at least not completely true. But in this video, the individual claims that the FAA contacted him more than once regarding some of his aerial videos that he had posted on YouTube. He states that they called him after watching YouTube looking for drone pilots who may be violating UAV rules. That's the first thing that made me question the video. He stated that the agents were polite and educated him and gave warnings and then closed his cases related to potential visual line of sight loss as well as posting monetized aerial footage on YouTube. He then goes on to say how he studied for and got his part 107 remote pilot certificate. Awesome, great. But here is why I kind of doubt this story. The FAA is specifically instructed that online aerial footage is not to be used to begin investigations. A couple of years ago, I got a hold of this. This right here is from the FAA internal rule book from volume 16, chapter five in regards to the process that must be followed by field inspectors when investigating potential violations. In section 3-5, it states that UAS videos in particular are increasingly appearing on the internet UAS videos may depict aircraft being flown in a variety of classes of airspace and at varying altitudes. Inspectors are to follow the protocol below when receiving notification of videos with potentially non-compliant UAS operations posted to the internet. Inspectors are reminded that number one, electronic media posted on the internet is only one form of evidence which may be used to support an enforcement action and it must be authenticated. Number two, electronic media posted on the internet is ordinarily not sufficient evidence alone to determine that an operation is not in compliance with 14 CFR. However, electronic media may serve as evidence of possible violations and may be retained for future enforcement action. So let's go back a few years. I don't know if you remember when Casey Neistat got in trouble from the FAA for flying his drone in New York City. And a lot of people thought that he got in trouble from them because he was posting these videos on YouTube and making money from those aerial videos, but that's not the case. The reason that Casey got in trouble is because he was breaking a lot of rules. He was flying over people, flying in restricted airspace, and some other things that were going on there. So he was actually reported to the FAA. They began an investigation and then they used those videos as part of that investigation. Now, overall, everything worked out for Casey and just like they do with most people, they just educate and inform because you know they're instructed to assume that people just have no clue what's going on 
And so for the most part, they're gonna be pretty nice about it, unless you're doing something really, really stupid, and we have seen a few of those as well. But anyway, it goes on to say on number three, inspectors have no authority to direct or suggest that electronic media posted on the internet must be removed. So even if you are doing something that is against regulations, and you know, you're doing something that you have posted up on YouTube that shows you doing something illegal, and you're making money off that video, they can't tell you to take it down. You can leave that video up there. And then finally, and most importantly, the note, where it says electronic media posted on a video website does not automatically constitute a commercial operation or commercial purpose or other non-hobby or non-recreational use. Now that one can be argued about until the cows come home because just because the videos may be monetized on a social media website, does not mean that the flight was a commercial operation. You can assume that it is, but it's not an automatic distinction. There is a difference, fight me. And the reason I say that so much is all the time I see people commenting, oh boy, you have monetized aerial footage. I hope you have your part 107. Oh, I see you have monetized YouTube video footage and you're flying a drone. I hope you have your part 107. There's a lot of drone police out there and yes, you probably should have your part 107, but guess what? It does not automatically mean that that flight was used for a commercial operation. A good lawyer would get you off every time. So feel free to talk about that down in the comments. <laughs> then this goes on to direct the inspectors that the first course of action is always to educate and inform with the understanding that in most instances, this will correct non-compliance. How do they inform the potential violators? with a certified letter through the US mail. Nowhere does it state that they will call you on the phone. So there you go. This is why no one has ever been charged with anything for posting monetized aerial videos on YouTube without possessing a part 107 remote pilot certificate. The burden of proof is much too time intensive, in my opinion, for FAA inspectors to be sitting at home at the computer watching YouTube videos hoping to catch some ignorant pilots making $10 a month from their AdSense revenue. And by the way, it's not a license, it's only a certificate. There's no such thing as a drone license or a licensed drone pilot. Now, if Crazy Joe is flying his Phantom 4 Pro at 200 feet off the end of runway 27 at JFK, and then he posts a video about it on YouTube, a lot of people are gonna see that video and they're gonna start making phone calls and then the FAA is gonna start doing an investigation and then they're gonna go watch those videos. You can bet that the FAA will be paying a visit to Joe at his RV and they will be using that footage as part of the evidence to prosecute him. But even in a very severe case like that, the protocol calls for education first. And then even if Joe is prosecuted and sent to jail, he can still leave that video public on YouTube and collect AdSense revenue from it. So here's the takeaway. If you do something blatantly stupid and dangerous, and then you record it and post it, you're gonna get a letter or quite possibly a knock at your door. If you endanger the national airspace system, you deserve to be punished. But if you're flying in your backyard, recording your annual family cornhole tournament from the air, and then you post it on your YouTube channel with AdSense enabled, what are the chances that you're gonna get a phone call from the field inspector, from the FSDO that's not even in your district? It's pretty darn low. The bottom line, you guys, fly safely, fly within visual line of sight, get your part 107 if you wanna make money off your drone videos, and take comfort in the fact that the FAA is not sitting at home in their pajamas and drinking cocoa during COVID, making phone calls like your mom telling you to straighten up. Subscribe for upcoming news on Remote ID and other drone videos. Follow me on social media. Check out my 51 Drones merchandise right below this video. Use the code 51 October for 10% off any order through the month of October. Thanks a ton for watching the entire video today. Have a great day and as always fly safe and fly smart.